Picking up, we left off, if I remember correctly, the other day, Thursday, um, with Aunt Marge's big mistake, and don't think we quite talked about when Harry blows her up, enlarges her, whatever terminology um, you want to use to describe what happens. <clears throat> but he does, and he leaves the house. Page uh, picking up with the night bus then on uh, chapter three. We're told he's several streets away, Magnolia Crescent. He stumbles and puts out his arm to break his fall, and the night bus appears, okay? He gets on the night bus, he meets Stan Shunpike and Ernie Prang, pages 35 and following, and he hears more, or let me be more specific, he reads more about this escaped Convict. I need something to hold that open. <clears throat> Which we haven't talked about yet. I almost put serious snake. I almost did it again. Serious black man. <clears throat> Which he'd heard about um, in the kitchen at home in the news. His father was reading a newspaper, um, and it was also, if I remember correctly, on the news. And back there, Vernon made a comment about Sirius Black that related to his appearance. Anybody know what that was? That is, he looked at the image of Sirius Black, and he drew a conclusion based on that. Anybody remember that? He essentially said, all you have to do is look at him to see that he's no good, okay? Because he's got thin, stripy hair, his face is drawn, um, you know, because he's been a prisoner for um, quite a while, okay? Harry doesn't know anything about him other than that he's an escaped mass murderer, okay? When he gets on the night bus, he reads over someone's shoulder. She's going to come up later in the series. He reads over someone's shoulder about Sirius Black and finds out he escaped from Azkaban. Okay? He still doesn't know hardly anything about him. <clears throat> so the night bus drops him off at the Leaky Cauldron. Pick up with... 43. Now, what name did Harry give when he got on the night bus? Neville. Neville. Okay. Roland just kind of giving us these little indications of similarities between Harry and Neville. So, he steps off the bus, page 43, and there's Cornelius Fudge. Now, Fudge introduces himself because he's never met Harry before, right? But Harry knows exactly who he is because Harry has seen him before. Fudge didn't know that Harry had seen him before, all right? And he says, well, Harry, bottom of 43, you've had us all on a white flap, I don't mind telling you, running away from your aunt, uncle's house like that. I'd started to think, but you're safe, and that's all that matters, Okay. So Fudge goes on and blathers a bit and says, you know, all that remains is to decide what's going to happen to you for the next two weeks. Where are you going to stay? You don't have to go back home. Don't worry. We're not going to worry about that. We've modified your aunt and uncle's memories. We've modified Aunt Marge's, or let me take that back. Modified Aunt Marge's memory, but they haven't done his aunt and uncle's. In top of 45... Excuse me, Harry says, 
what about my punishment? Punishment? I broke the law. The decree for the restriction of underage wizardry, right? Because before he leaves, there's a letter from Mephalda Hopkirk. Same person, book two, that Harry got a letter from because of Dobby's performing magic in the house, okay? I broke the law. Oh, my dear boy, we're not going to punish you for a little thing like that. It was an accident. We don't send people to Azkaban just for blowing up their aunts. No, but they send people to Azkaban for what? Book two. For, um, assuming he was haggard. Suspicion of guilt, okay? Here, they know Harry did this, all right? Was it intentional? Did Harry blow up Aunt Marge intentionally? Did he have his wand in his hand when he did it? No, he didn't. It was, it was accidental. He was kind of, should I go there? Yeah, he was kind of blowing off steam or transferring some of his anger and frustration into her. Hold on to that idea of transferring anger and frustration, okay? Remember what Dumbledore told Harry at the end of book one, what Voldemort did the night he gave Harry his scar? Transferred some of his powers into Harry. Harry interprets that. You mean he put a bit of himself into me? Dumbledore agrees, okay? Later on, book five, we're going to see again Harry transferring some of his anger and such onto somebody else. So, Harry says, last year I got a warning. I, it said I would be expelled. Circumstances change, Harry. We have to take into account in the present climate. You don't want to be expelled. Of course not. Well then, okay. What's Harry's point? I didn't misspoke. He didn't get a letter this year. But what's his point? He still did it. Why isn't he getting punished for it? In other words, Harry has what notion of the law? It, it's kind of, you know, in stone. You can't violate it. It can't be... Notice the verb, verb I'm going to use because I'm using it intentionally. It can't be fudged. You can't massage the law so that it works sometimes and doesn't work other times, all right? It's one of the issues Rowling is going to raise in this novel, and then she's going to follow in some others, is the unequal application of the law. How it's not applied across the board equally to everyone. It depends on who's wielding the power of the law, who's running the government, in other words, okay? So, Harry gets to live at the Leaky Cauldron for the next two weeks, goes into, goes into the Diagon Alley every day, gets free ice cream and such, okay? And... Just before going off to Hogwarts, um, meets up with the Weasleys, okay? He gets this new school list and such. Hermione shows up also. <clears throat> what new class does Harry have this year? And has he dropped any classes? Does he drop a class to fit this one in? No, he doesn't drop a class. It's like everything you start with your first year, that continues, okay? Until you reach a point, fifth year, okay, where you have to decide what you're going to do the last two years. That is, 
if you know you've got potions year one through five, you've got defense against the dark arts year one through five. But beginning with six and seven, some of those might drop depending upon your performance in them up to that point and how you do on your owls, okay? So he gets divination this year and it's implied everybody has divination in their third year, okay? And we're told, page 53, He's looking at his book list. He's in flourishing bots. And he has to get Unfogging the Future by Cassandra. I'm trying, I never remember how to spell her last name. Cassandra Vablotsky. Okay. Why is this important? I don't remember if her name was Cassandra or not. But there is a real world medium slash occultist slash fortune teller named or called Madame Blavatsky in the early 20th century. She was very famous. I mean like Hollywood stars and writers went to her for advice and stuff. Uh, if I remember correctly, I may be wrong, so don't hold me to it. But if I remember correctly, Arthur Conan Doyle was good friends with her and kind of, you know, relied on her for some advice and such, all right? So this real world, quote unquote, magic, Madame Blavatsky, Cassandra Vablatsky is the author of the textbook that will be used in divination. Okay. Um, let's see, I don't think there's anything else I want to say about the Leaky Cauldron other than two things. Harry is introduced to Ron's new pet, Scabbers. Okay. That belonged to Percy, I believe. He used to belong to my brother. He takes him into the, essentially the pet store, to find out what's wrong with him. Um, how old is he? The guy asked page 59. Uh, excuse me, the, the woman at the counter, she says he's been through the mill, this one, Ron. He's like that when Percy gave him to me. An ordinary common rat like this can't be expected to live longer than three years or so. Okay. But how long have they had scabbers? We'll just let that question hang. Hermione has a new pet. Okay. Crookshanks. Um, Percy is now head boy. And... Harry overhears a conversation with Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. What's the conversation about? Sirius Black. Sirius Black. What about him? They think he's going after Harry. They think he's going after Harry. Okay. Does Harry overhear perfectly the conversation? How many... And I don't know the answer just off the top, by my, top of my head. How many overheard conversations have we had so far in the books? Quite a few, okay? As we also, you know, had at least a couple in Lord of the Rings. Why do you think both these authors, Rowling more than Tolkien, because Rowling includes many, many more. Why do you, do, why do you think she includes this trope, this image. Let me put it this way. Does good always come of these overheard conversations? What often does come? Misinterpretation. 
misinterpretation. It's exactly right. Harry, you know, go back to Sorcerer's Stone for a moment. Harry overheard the conversation between Quirrell and Snape, okay? And what did he assume? Snape was threatening Quirrell, forcing him to try to get the stone. Okay? And it was, it turned out to be what? Just the opposite. Okay? So we're going to see that kind of thing, and it's going to go all throughout. In fact, we're going to come to discover the main conflict in all seven books is caused by a misheard or misinterpreted overheard conversation or an incomplete overheard conversation. And it seems to me Rowling is kind of suggesting don't eavesdrop. Don't listen into conversations that aren't, that you're not personally involved in. Okay? So, they get on the train, and Harry, Ron, and Hermione can't find, well, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, the only cabin they can find, the only carriage they can find, is one with an occupant already in it. Let me go back for a moment to just before they get on the train. Mr. Weasley pulls Harry aside, and before he can say anything, what does Harry do? I know what you're going to say, and Mr. Weasley tells him, don't go looking for trouble. And Harry responds, actually, I think that's going to come out. One of the characters, might be Ron, um, says, don't go looking for trouble. And Harry says, I don't. It just comes and finds me. Did trouble come find Harry? To make him go through the trap door? No. Because remember Dumbledore's words. You did do the thing properly. In other words, he knew he was going to, but Harry went ahead and did all the research and such first. Okay? So, Harry says, page 75. Actually, he is talking to Mr. Weasley. Oh, Harry, you'll have to be... No, this is Hermione saying it. Right, the reason I was confused is because Mr. Weasley is just before. Well, Harry, you'll have to be really, really careful. Don't go looking for trouble, Harry. I don't go looking for trouble. Trouble usually finds me. Ron, how thick would Harry have to be to go looking for a nutter who wants to kill him? Okay. Previous page, because they're in the carriage at that point. Previous page, they see the, the sole occupant of the carriage until they come in. And he has a battered up old briefcase, essentially, bottom of page 74, that has a tag on it that says Professor R.J. Lupin, okay, who we're going to be introduced to very briefly. What's his full name? Remus, I don't know what the name is. It's John, actually. Remus John Lupin. What are the similarities between his first name and his last name? Anybody know? Ancient mythology. Remus, brother of Romulus, the two founders of Rome, who, according to mythology, were suckled by a she-wolf. All right? Because they were abandoned as babies. Either abandoned or captured, something like that. But they were raised by a mother wolf. Okay? Lupin, lupus, wolf, flat, okay? Serious black, what is, um, what does Sirius transform into? Dog. Big black dog. Sirius, the star, anybody know what it's called? It's the dog star. It indicates the quote-unquote dog days of summer have arrived when it is the brightest star kind of in the sky, okay? So, 
Um, they're talking about Hogsmeade. Harry can't go. Crab and Goyle come in with Malfoy. Malfoy says some stuff. Hermione, you know, uh, or Ron, one of them, points to Lupin. It kind of, you know, gets Crab and Goyle and Malfoy to leave. And page 82. Okay. Actually, page 81. Train stops running, slows down, it goes dark, okay? They hear a noise out in the passageway. So you have Harry, Ron, Hermione, Neville in the carriage. I think, just double checking. Jenny has left again because Ron told her to go away. And they kind of start to, you know, get the willies a bit. And they hear the voice of Lupin say, stay, stay where you are, page 83. Door opens up. The carriage door slides open. And we're told, standing in the doorway, illuminated by the shivering flames in Lupin's hand, was a cloaked figure that towered to the ceiling. Its face was completely hidden beneath its hood. Harry's eyes darted downward and saw, excuse me, and what he saw made his stomach contract. Um, there was a hand protruding from the, gray, uh, from the cloak and it was glistening, grayish, slimy looking and scabbed like something dead that had decayed in water, okay? But whatever this thing was, it withdraws slowly, and here he is overcome with a feeling of cold. His eyes roll back in his head, and he passes out. Okay. Page 84. Harry comes back, is awakened. Lupin gives him chocolate, okay, and he tells him, page 85, what that thing was. A Dementor. Okay. Ron, I thought you were having a fit or something. Lupin stepped over you, walked toward the Dementor, pulled out his wand. And he said, none of us is hiding serious black under our cloaks. Go. Neville, it was horrible. Did you feel how cold? Ron, weird. Felt like I'd never be cheerful again. Ginny is still there. Okay. She just gives a little small sob. Hermione goes over, comforts her. Harry, yeah, but none of you fell off your seats. None of them also. Why did Harry fall off his seat? He fainted. He passed out. None of them passed out. Ron, no. Jenny was shaking like mad, though. Lupin came back. He asked Harry if he was all right. He said, fine. Okay. What does Neville do, apparently, like from there in the next five minutes he goes and tells everybody up and down the train Harry Potter passed out when a Dementor came into our room why why would Neville do this think selfishly What amazing thing has Neville done in his first two years? Yeah, Wes is shaking his head. Nothing. He's got nothing. What does he now have? I didn't pass out, but Harry Potter did. He's got, in one sense, he's got something up on Harry. Okay? That's, that's the only reason I can think of as to why he does this, all right? Malfoy comes in, bottom of 87, and we're gonna go pretty quickly after this. Gotta get into the Dementor for a moment. You fainted, Potter? Is Longbottom telling the truth? You actually fainted? Turn the page. 
Shove off, Malfoy, says Ron. Did you faint as well, Weasley? Did the scary old Dementor frighten you too? Lupin shows up. Okay. And they leave. So, McGonagall asks Harry and Hermione, you know, I want to see you both. Harry, you fine? He says, I'm fine. Madam Pomfrey is there, right? Because she's the nurse slash, you know, doctor on call. McGonagall tells her it was a Dementor. And we're told, page 89, setting Dementors around a school, especially people who are delicate. Harry, I'm not delicate, right? Book one should have told people, Harry isn't delicate. Book two should have told people, Harry isn't delicate, okay? So McGonagall, what does he need? Harry, I'm fine. Well, he needs chocolate. I've already had some. And Pomfrey says, finally, a defense against the dark arts professor who knows his job. Okay, so. Look at that word. Lupin's going to get Harry a lesson in Dementors. Pretty shortly. We'll probably get to it because I know we, we're supposed to finish this today. Look at that word. What's the root of that word? It has a prefix and a suffix. Here's the prefix. Here's the suffix. Mint, men's, mind is what that means, okay? You all have not necessarily a mentor, but you have an advisor. It's the same thing. What does a mentor slash advisor do, supposedly? It's supposed to help you. Supposed to help you. How is your major advisor supposed to help you in your major? order of which classes you need to take, what classes you need to take for your major and such. If you have a minor, what classes you need, when you ought to take them, when to fill out appropriate paperwork, all that kind of stuff. Why? What's that supposed to help you do? It takes a little bit of pressure off of you. Take some pressure off you, keep you on track so that you can, you know, uh, have quote unquote student success. So APSU can be a student centered learning community. I hate all this educational gobbledygook, okay? Or supposedly educational gobbledygook. So that you can do what? Achieve your goals. So that, you know, I'll use more propaganda. Be, hello there, spider. Go down to your crawl at this table. Um, so that you can be all that you can be, you know, to channel the army or navy, okay? That's what a mentor does, all right? Literally, one who minds, because the O-R ending is male active, the male agent. If you wanted it to be female, it would be mentress, okay? It's not sexist to do that, it's just, so one who encourages, helps grow the mind, etc. A gay mentor is just the opposite. One who shrinks the mind, shrinks the soul, stunts the growth, stops the progression. All right? Notice what is used to help overcome that. The dementing. Chocolate. Why? Rowling said in an, in an interview that her inspiration for Dementors was depression. The Dementors are a physical manifestation of the effects of depression. Because what happens when you're really depressed? I don't mean, oh, I got a bad grade and I'm kind of down for the day. I mean, nearly suicidal depressed. You don't see any hope. You don't see any future. It's not that there's a light at the end of a tunnel. It's that the tunnel is just black and there's no getting out of it, okay? Well, physiologically, how does the body respond to chocolate unless you're allergic to chocolate? 
can't think of almost the worst allergy. It releases dopamine when you eat it. Dopamine is the natural high hormone. It, it makes you feel good, okay? Notice, to overcome the effects of a, of a Dementor, you eat chocolate because it creates that natural high. So, Dumbledore gives his beginning of the year, you know, school speech, talks about the Dementors, talks about Sirius Black, says this isn't something to play with. This is, you know, this is dangerous stuff. Don't go off into the forbidden forest. Don't do things you shouldn't do, okay? And at one point, he looks at the Weasley twins. Because you know Fred and George are going to push the envelope. Talons and tea leaves. Not going to say much about other than... Um, well, let's back up. Page 97, 98. They're kind of comparing classes. And Ron looks at Hermione's schedule, top of 98. They messed up your schedule. They've got you down for about 10 subjects a day. There isn't enough time. I'll manage. I'll fix it with, you know. Harry, Ron says, but look, 9 o'clock, divination. Underneath that, 9 o'clock, muggle studies. How can you do those both? And wait. Underneath that, arithmancy. I know you're good, Hermione put it on me. She says, don't worry, I won't be in three classes at once, but, and she just kind of, you know, passes the subject aside, okay? So they go on to divination with Sybil Trelawney. Trelawney is an old English name. It's, it's usually associated with people who are high class, right? Sybil, however, is what? Anybody know? It goes back to ancient Greece. Ancient Greece and Rome. Sybils were prophetesses. They foretold the future. All right? She is a direct relation to... Cassandra, I always mispronounce it, Vablotsky. I always want to say Vlobotsky because of this, okay? We're, we're going to be told later. So, let's talk for a moment about the kinds of magic you learn at, at Hogwarts, right? You've got potions, you have herbology, Transfiguration, um, charms, da da, defense against the dark arts. Which, if you know anything about art, there's a school of art called the Dada movement, which was kind of the breakdown of representational art. Um, oh, what's his name? Picasso was a member of the Dada school, okay? Angular figures, not representational by, by any means. Kind of interesting, you know, that this, in one sense, inhuman art school is kind of paralleled by, you know, this in a sense. Um, Charms, Dada. What else did they have first year? I know I'm going to blank. So now we get introduced to uh, history and magic. Okay. Now we get into arithmancy, muggle studies, and divination. Does everyone have to take arithmancy and muggle studies? Nope, those are electives. But everybody does have to take divination beginning second year. Uh, also, I forget what Harry's class is called. Um, Care of Magical Creatures. Yeah. Which doesn't begin till what year? This year. This year. Yep. Okay. What? Think about 
about all of these for a second. Potions, what is that in the real world? Chemistry. Horticulture. Don't have one. Don't have one. Don't have one. History. What is arithmancy? It's the magic of numbers, essentially. Okay? Eh, don't really have one. Sociology. <laughs> Divination. Is that theology? Philosophy? No. Care of magical creatures? Veterinary studies, essentially. Right? But it's kind of interesting, of all these sources, or all these classes, when you look at them according to what they actually are, which of these has a real world branch of magic, occult, associated with it? There's only one. That has an actual real world form of that kind of magic in it. It's this one. You go, you can go into every city, major city, town of probably 50,000, maybe 100,000 in the United States, and you can go somewhere and have your palm read. You can go somewhere and have someone look at a ball and tell you your future. You can have tea leaves read. You can't go in Murfreesboro or Nashville to learn Transfiguration. Herbology, Maybe in a few years, you know, when weed shops start opening up, I guess maybe that could be considered herbology. Potions? No. Unless you want to say, whoa, essential oils. That's potions today. The way some people talk about them, it sounds like they are. Okay? This is the only one where you can go to a practitioner of this. Why is that important? Or is that important? Is Snape a quack? Is Snape fraudulent? A charlatan? No. Professor Hooch? Uh, sorry, not Hooch. Um, Sprout? No. Nope. No. Because <laughs> Dumbledore and then McGonagall? No. Flitwick? N no. Okay, this one's a bit problematic because they're all frauds. Take that back. Lupin's the best teacher Harry ever had. Until the next teacher, which is problematic, okay? I don't even remember who the arithmetic professor is. Muggle studies? No, she's not. She's short for this world. Um, magical creatures? Hagrid's kind of, you know, borderline. But Grumbly Plank? She knows her stuff backwards and forwards. She's kind of crazy. She's a quack. All right? Why? Is rolling suggesting anything there? By having the only branch of magic that is described in the magical world that has a real world component. In fact, it's the only branch of magic that Dumbledore and McGonagall both speak disparagingly of. Dumbledore even says towards the end of the book, you know, he thought of getting rid of it. And if I remember correctly, I think they do get rid of it after this book. Okay? But they're still doing Eric Mancy, they're still doing muggle studies, they're still doing all of these others. I think rolling, I have no basis for this. I have no you know, comment from an interview or anything like that to prove it. I think rolling is, is kind of saying, folks, magic isn't real. And if you look at the one branch that is quote unquote real, it's what? It's chicanery. It's charlatanism. It's false. You can't put any stock 
in this? How do we know? What happens? Harry's first class. The grim, someone's going to die. Okay? And what do we find out? How long, how often has Trelawney said that? Every year since she'd been there. Okay? And how many students have died in all that time? Zero. Okay? So, uh, page 109, it's McGonagall who points out she's predicted the death of a student a year since she arrived here. None of them has died yet. Seeing death omens, this is the middle of 109, is her favorite way of greeting a new class. If it were not for the fact that I ever speak ill of my colleagues, which she's just done, okay, she says, you look in excellent health, you're fine. Um, okay, so they go off to Hagrid's class. Hagrid teaches them how to open their books because Notice in the previous book, Harry had a book that misled him, right? It lied to him, the diary. Now he has a book that could hurt him, could damage, could literally eat probably parts of him, okay? So what's that? Am I reading too much into that? Is it suggesting something? Can books be physically dangerous? I shouldn't go there. <laughs> no, I should, no, I'm not going to go there. Um, I was going to ask the question. Shut up, Ted. Yeah, what the hell? Are words physically harmful? Can words physically harm you? Nobody can lead. Okay, it can lead to harm, right? Yeah. What did Malfoy call Hermione? Book two. Mudblood. Mud what you know, how how'd that physically harm someone? Ron tried to cast a spell, backfired, so he's burping up slugs. You, I guess you could call that physical harm. But words themselves, if you're called a name, does that physically harm you? No. Mentally, sure. It can scar you, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, Hagrid has a hippogriff. Buck beak. Harry goes up, pets it, flies it, etc. Malfoy goes up. Describe the difference between Harry and Malfoy's approach to Buckbeak. Malfoy is the, uh, he likes to be dominant. What does Harry show to Buckbeak? Respect. Respect. Why? Well, Hagrid tells them they're very proud creatures. Okay? What's a hippogriff? Literally, what is a hippogriff? Half eagle, half horse. Okay? So, big, because horse, you know, big. And then it has what instead of a horse's head and mouth? It's got the eagle's neck. Okay, now imagine the size of a horse with a corresponding eagle's head and beak. Pretty dangerous, all right? So, you know, Malfoy walks up to it and essentially says, page 118, I bet you're not dangerous at all, are you? Are you? You great, ugly brute. Okay, and the hippogriff bites him, okay? Uh, hey, you know, Malfoy runs up to the castle to get fixed and such. Um, Harry, Ron, and Hermione come down to 
talked to Halford, uh, Alfred, Hagrid later on. They tell him Malfoy's okay and such. Chapter 7, Bogger in the Wardrobe. So they have potions first. And Snake picks on Neville as he usually does. Page 130 and 31. They go off to defense against the Dark Arts. Lupin takes them into the staff room. There's a cabinet. In the cabinet, the cabinet has a bogger. J.K. Rowling does not in invent boggers, by the way. A bogger is a Scottish, it's a figure in Scottish mythology or popular culture, if you want. Goes back hundreds of years, uh, the idea of boggers. The shape-shifting, not lacking a actual physical form, okay? So he says there's a boggart in there. What characterizes boggarts? What do they do? They change form into the shape of something you fear, okay? But what do they do other than that? What's their purpose? No idea. They're kind of like poltergeists, though. They're jokesters or tricksters. That is, is a bogger, you know, going to come out and kill you like a Dementor can? No, it's not. All right? So, he talks to them about boggarts. He asks them what they are, and Hermione answers. And he says, you know, nobody knows what a boggart, bottom of 133, what a boggart looks like, uh, when he's alone, but when I let him out, he'll immediately become whatever each each of us most fears. So he says that means we have an advantage over it. Do you know what that advantage is, Harry? Okay. Uh, it won't know what shape to take, right? Classroom full of students, classroom full of different fears. So it's going to kind of, you know, be discombobulated, so to speak. He says that's right. Always best to have company when you're dealing with a bargain. <coughs> Jump to book five. The Woes of Mrs. Weasley. Okay? So, he tells them a charm that repels a bargain. Ridiculous. What do you have to do? You have to say the word, for one. But what else do you do? You don't think of your worst fear. It's dead. You think of something funny or ridiculous. Something that, in a sense, will parody the boggart. Okay? And we're told, the charm that repels a boggart is simple, yet it requires force of mind. Okay? So, laughter. You need something amusing. So he says, let's try it at first. All right? They try it. So he says, Neville, you first. Why Neville? Snape was just in there. And, and he picked on Neville for being clumsy and like. So, what is Lupin doing? He's trying to get him to where Neville has more confidence in that. Building up Neville's confidence. He is serving as a mentor for Neville. Right? And Neville's like, oh. so, what's the thing that most frightens you in the world? And Neville's lips move, but they don't hear anything. Professor Snape. Nearly everyone laughs. Lupin, notice, looks thoughtful. He says, I believe you live with your grandmother. That's called a non sequitur. What does his grandmother have to do with Professor Snape? Uh, yes, I don't want it to turn into her either. No, 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 no. What sort of clothes does your grandmother wear? And so he describes them. And a handbag, right? Yep. Yeah. Big red one. Okay. So you got those clothes pictured, right, Neville? And notice he's described them in detail. So it's kind of like her image is fresh in his mind. All right? Yes. So when the bugger bursts out, here's what I want you to do. 
It's going to take the shape of Snape. But I want you to put those clothes mentally on the bard. So Snape comes out cross-dressing. Okay? <laughs> I never thought of that in relation to the current uproar with J.K. Rowling and the trans activists. Wow. It's an interesting thing. Um, so everybody laughs. And Harry thinks, what scares me the most? Voldemort? Huh. So Snape comes out dressed as Neville's grandmother. And everybody laughs. And Neville does the charm. Goes away. So Lupin says, Parvati, you next. She goes, okay. She takes care of it. Seamus. Seamus comes forward. There's a banshee. It gets sent back, okay. Dean Thomas, Ron. You know what Ron's is going to be, etc. Who doesn't get to do it? Two people, at least. Because we don't go through the entire class. Harry and Hermione. Harry and Hermione. Later on, Harry and Hermione are going to ask, Harry and Ron are going to ask Hermione, what would it have been for you? I think as Ron says, you know, a failing grade on a report card, which I find kind of funny because after my kids read this book, when they were still pretty young, my eldest son, one year for Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving for Halloween, made like a poster board report card with the classes, and they were all Fs. Kind of a thing, okay? Because he was a Harry Potter nerd. So, Harry, uh, I didn't do anything. Because Harry and Hermione each got five points. Well, Hermione answered the question. Harry's like, what's the five points for? You and Hermione answered my questions correctly at the start of class, Harry. Harry's like, nah, there's something else, okay? Flight of the Fat Lady. Uh, Quidditch match. And this is where we find out for the first time, what must you use to get into your dormitory's common room? Password. Password. Okay. Their dormitory common room is a round door. It's got a fat lady portrait on it. And you've got to know the password. The password changes, right? What happens to the fat lady? Goes away. Portrait gets slashed. So she runs away. And we find out portraits can move around to other portrait spaces. Okay. Um, who lost the password? No. So... Neville gets built up a little bit and it, you know, crashes and burns again. Um, grim defeat. Lupin is sick. So Snape teaches. What does Snape have them jump ahead to? Werewolves. Werewolves. And they have to write a really long scroll on werewolves. Why? Go ahead and say it. He doesn't like Lupin and he wants the students to pick up on Lupin, who apparently is the only one who does. Now, how long has Lupin been there? This is his first year. Um, where are they in the course of the year so far. Classes of the new year has just started, right? It's still September. So this is the first time that Lupin's been sick. What's going to happen between now and the end of this school year? There's probably going to be another eight times where Lupin will be sick. Notice, by the time that happens, when we get to the end of the school year, Harry and Ron still haven't put two and two together. 
but Hermione does. Okay. Go on to Marauder's Map. What is it? And who has it? It's a map of Hogwarts and Fred and George have it. What kind of map? Does it have only the teachers? Well, it, has it, everybody. it has everybody. Okay. On it. Their location. Only classrooms, dormitories, hallways. Secret tunnels. Secret tunnels, secret passageways. Everything. Everything that is within the Hogwarts boundaries, including below ground. Okay. And so it shows you all the entrances and exits of Hogwarts, and it shows you where everybody is. You have to say a spell in order for it to reveal itself, and you say another spell in order for it to clear itself, okay? Why do Fred and George give it to Harry? Okay, so Harry can go to Hogsmeade. Anybody remember the phrase they use? His need, they say, your need is greater than ours. Okay. Um, before they do that, here he has, they all have, another defense against the dark arts class. Okay. What happened in the Quidditch match in Grim Defeat? How many? There were like a hundred. And what happened to Harry? <laughs> Falls, right? Who are they playing? Because Cedric is the captain of the Hufflepuff team. Okay. What happened to Harry's his Nimbus 2000 Flew into the Whomping Willow, which whomped the crap out of it, beat it into matchsticks. Okay? 186. Lupin says, I heard about the match. Any chance of fixing your broom? No. They planted the Whomping Willow. Notice just a little bit of plot detail. They planted the Whomping Willow, same year I arrived at Hogwarts. People used to play game trying to get near enough to touch the trunk. In the end, a boy called Davy Gudgeon nearly lost an eye, and we were forbidden to go near it. Okay. Harry, did you hear about the Dementors? Yeah. Don't think I've ever, any of us have ever seen Professor Dumbledore that angry. They've been growing restless. Why? They're hungry. So, they're, why you fell? Yes. Why do they affect me like that? Am I nothing to do with weakness? He says, the Dementors affect you worse than the others because there are horrors in your past that the others don't have. Does Neville have horrors in his past that Harry doesn't have? Oh, yeah. yeah, quite a, yes he does. So, he tells about Dementors and tells us what they do Every good feeling, every happy memory, every joy will be sucked out of you. So for Harry, what will remain? Notice, does he have many happy memories? Does he have much joy? Only really since coming to Hogwarts. So that gets sucked away, and what's he left with? Life with the Dursleys and his parents' murder. Okay? When they hear me, I can hear Voldemort murdering my mom. Why'd they come to the match? They're getting hungry, okay? Now, we didn't talk about, or we didn't stop for when Harry first hears his mother's voice. It's back in that chapter, Grim Defeat. So Harry asks two things. One, well, let me back up. Harry says, um, Azkaban must be terrible. 
because to the mentors, regard as command. Helps them understand why Hagrid said, not Azkaban, okay? And Lupin says, yes, it is. Harry, but Sirius Black escaped from there. He got away. Lupin says, yes, he did. Harry, you made the Dementors back off. Well, there are defenses. What are they? Can you teach me? Lupin, okay, I'll try. Does he tell Harry at this point, Harry, this is really, really advanced magic. I'll, you're probably not going to be able to. No, he doesn't. Okay. We don't really find out how advanced the magic is, right? Until book five. Two instances in book five. One at the beginning of the novel, one towards the end of the novel, where we get an indication that most... I think we're actually told. Most fully qualified wizards and witches can't do this charm. Okay? They expect a Patronum charm. So, Fred and George run into Harry and they give him the Marauder's Map. And they tell him this is the secret to our success. Harry can't get into a Hogsmeade any other way. So they tap the map and say, I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good. Bottom of 192. Messrs. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs, purveyors of aids to magical mischief makers, are proud to present the Marauder's Map. What's a Marauder? It's another word for Marauder. like a Viking. What do they do? They come in, they rape, kill, and steal. Okay, but this is like 14-year-old version, 13-year-old version of that, okay? So they were a little bit older when the map was made, the Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. So, to show Harry how it works, Page 194, Harry remembers Mr. Weasley telling Jenny, never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. And he's thinking, hmm, don't know. But he uses it. He uses it for what purpose? Goes to Hogsmeade, meets up with Ron and Hermione in Honey Dukes. They go to the three broomsticks. He doesn't meet up. He surprises them. They go to the three broomsticks. And what happens? An issue thing we've talked about earlier today. Harry eavesdrops. Because they're sitting in one place and there are Christmas trees around them. Harry's got under his invisibility cloak. And in comes pages 208, 209. Actually, I think they come in earlier, 207. In comes McGonagall, Hagrid, Flitwick, Fudge, to sit down and have a beer. Proverbially, each one has something different, okay? And they talk with Madame Rosmerta. Anybody know any significance to the name Rosmerta? She's a Celtic goddess of hospitality. I don't know if you've ever seen a St. Pauli girl t-shirt. These are t-shirts with the St. Pauli girl. St. Pauli beer is a German beer. And, it, you know, blonde with, um, what do you, pigtails, you know, kind of busty and stuff. But it's a t-shirt of a girl holding like, I don't remember, it's like four or five big steins of beer. Waitress, okay? That's Madame Rosemerica, goddess of hospitality, serving them, okay? So, they start to listen in on this conversation. Bottom of...
202 is where it begins. Okay. And Rosmerta says, 203, I still have trouble believing it. Of all the people to go over to the dark side, serious black man, last person I'd have thought. Okay. Tells us what? She knew serious black. She knew James. She knew Lily. They probably came and drank there. Okay. Quite the double act, page 204. Madame Rosmerta says, Sirius Black and James Potter. And Harry drops his tankard. McGonagall takes that theme and starts to run with it. Okay. Flitwick, you'd have thought Black and Potter were brothers. Inseparable. Fudge, of course they were. Potter trusted Black beyond all his other friends. Nothing changed when they left school. Black was best man when James married Lily. Then they named him Godfather to Harry. Harry has no idea, of course. Except now. <laughs> you can imagine how the idea would torment him, Miss Madame Rosmerita, because Black turned out to be in league with you-know-who? Worse than that. What kind of information are they talking about? Yes, this is this kind of talk that belongs where? In the United States, I don't know what the Brits have. We have, you know, specially compartmented something. I can't remember what the IS stands for. It, it's what, you know, when people in the government really want to really talk about or read Super, super, super top secret stuff. They go into a room. It's called a skiff room. No electronic signals can go in and out of this room, and you can't bring any electronic devices in. You can't bring any note-taking devices in, like a pen or paper. Members of Congress, when they want to read a highly classified intelligence report, have to go into there. They have to empty their pockets, the whole nine yards, okay? That's where they should be talking about this kind of stuff. And where are they? They're in a pub. Okay? It's partly because of this that they come up with the idea of not using the three broomsticks, but using the hogshead. In hogshead? Is that the right name? In book five for the Defense Against the Dark Arts class, the Dumbledore, Dumbledore's Army class. Okay? So they go on and they talk about Fudge and uh, Sirius Black and stuff. And Fudge mentions about the last time he saw him, 209, when he was checking on the prisoners. He says, you know, most of the prisoners in there sit muttering to themselves in the dark. No sense in them. But I was shocked at how normal Black seemed. He spoke quite rationally to me. Asked if I'd finished my newspaper and if I could read it. What was on that newspaper? We've seen it already. Picture of Ron and his family in Egypt. Picture of the Weasleys on the front cover. Okay? With scabbers. With scabbers in Ron's shirt pocket. Firebolt. Christmas comes. Harry gets presents again, okay? 214. They get back to Hogwarts, and Ron and Hermione want to talk Harry out of what? It's kind of the same thing Hermione said earlier after Harry told them about what he'd overheard Mr. and Mrs. Weasley talking. Don't go looking for trouble. Page 214. Hermione says to Harry, You don't look well. I'm fine. You must be really upset about what we heard yesterday. You mustn't do anything stupid. Like what? Like, give me an idea here, you know? Like trying to go after Black, says Ron. You won't, will you? Hermione asks. Ron, because Black's not worth dying for. Notice that, by the way. Black's not worth dying for. Was anybody else? Hmm. 
Harry looked at them. You know what I see and hear every time a Dementor gets too near me? They look, shake their heads. I can hear my mum screaming and pleading with Voldemort. And if you'd heard your mum screaming like that, just about to be killed, you wouldn't forget it in a hurry. And if you found out someone who is supposed to be a friend of hers betrayed her and sent Voldemort after her, Hermione, there's nothing you can do. The Dementors will catch him. You heard what Fudge said. They don't affect him. Notice, Harry's already kind of thinking three steps ahead. Dementors don't affect him. They affect me. Lupin is supposed to teach me how to fight them. I'm going to figure out how to repel them, and then I'm going after it. I mean, that's where his mind is going. Okay? Harry, uh, Ron, so what are you saying? You want to kill Black or something? 214. Bottom, top of 215. Hermione, don't be silly. Harry doesn't want to kill anyone. Do you, Harry? Silence. <laughs> Malfoy knows. Remember what he said to me in potions? If it was me, I'd hunt him down myself. Ron, wisely. So you're going to take advice from Malfoy instead of us? You know what Pettigrew's mother got back after Black had finished with him? Dad told me. The Order of Merlin first class in Pettigrew's finger in a box. Why? Why give the box with the finger? Closure. Because what's the implication? That's all that was left. Okay. What did Sirius Black supposedly do? Blow up 12, 13 muggles, I think it was, and Peter Pettigrew. Malfoy's dad must have told him Harry says notice he's not listening he's just kind of talking out loud what he's thinking of he was right in Voldemort's inner circle Ron say you know who so obviously the Malfoy's knew Black was working for Voldemort and Malfoy would love to see you get blown into about a million bits Hermione Harry please be sensible your mother and father wouldn't want this Top of 216. I'll never know what they'd have wanted because thanks to Black, I've never spoken to them. What are we seeing build up in Harry? Louder? Rage. rage. What does that rage lead to? Thirst for? Revenge. Okay. So, Ron comes up with a good idea. It's Christmas. Let's go talk to Hagrid. Hermione, no, Harry isn't supposed to leave the castle, Ron. And Harry's like, yeah, let's go talk to Hagrid. Why? What have they done every other time they've gone and talked to Hagrid? They've got information. Hagrid is not a, you know, sealed trap door kind of a thing. Okay? So, when they go down to talk to Hagrid, in what state of mind is Harry? Use your word you used earlier. Rage. Harry's angry. He wants to confront Hagrid. Okay? They hear a weird noise. Knock on the door. Hagrid answers. Okay. Hagrid's been crying. Have a letter, 217, 218. What's the letter say? We have decided to uphold the official complaint of Mr. Lucius Malfoy, and this matter will therefore be taken to the Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures. Hearing will take place on April 20th. We ask you to present yourself and your hippogriff at the Committee's offices in London. Okay. Harry, Ron, and Hermione all say they will do what? They'll help Hagrid. They'll help him come up with a case to present. Okay. What does Hagrid say about this committee? It doesn't take evidence. I mean, it does, but the very fact that Buckbeat's going before it, decision's been made. It's a sham committee. It's a show trial. Okay. 
Hagrid, 219. Them disposal devils, they're all in Lucius Malfoy's pocket. Scared of them. And if I lose the case, Buckbeak, Harry, what about Dumbledore? Dumbledore can't do any more for me, he says. Okay? So, they keep talking. Hagrid talks about the Dementors. He talks about, he talks about Azkaban, bottom of 220. Thought I was going mad. Kept going over horrible stuff in me mind. The day I got expelled from Hogwarts. Day me dad died. Day I had to let Norbert go. You know, book one. You can't really remember who you are after a while. You can't see the point of living at all. I used to hope I'd just die in me sleep. When they let me out, it was like being born again. Kind of sounds like... Name... Dobby, talking about when Harry first defeated the Dark Lord. The dregs of the magical world, it was like a beacon of hope, a light shining in darkness. Everything came flooding back. Hermione, but you were innocent. What's Hermione thinking? The law should have protected him. Think that matters to them, not the ministry, the mentors. They don't care, as long as they got a couple hundred humans stuck there with them, so they can leech all the happiness out. Okay? He says, I'm scared of breaking the law again. I don't want to go back to Azkaban. Bottom of 221. The trip to Hagrid's, though far from fun, had nevertheless had the effect Ron and Hermione had hoped. Though Harry had by no means forgotten about Black, he couldn't brood constantly on revenge if he wanted to help Hagrid. Okay, so he goes down full of revenge and hate towards Black. Okay? And what happens by the time he leaves? Let me put it this way. Revenge and hate are focused outwardly, all right, at something or somebody else. But they're only focused outwardly, why? Where are they really? They're inside. Revenge and hate do what inside to a person? Do that make that person feel more joyful, better about life? Does life seem richer, fuller, greater, etc.? No. Okay. He wants to go down and chew Hagrid's you know what off to try to figure out what Hagrid knows. And instead, he's introduced. To what on Hagrid's part? How does he see Hagrid? Is he angry at Hagrid? No. Why not? Why does Hagrid have tears running down his face? What's that show us about Hagrid's state of mind or state of heart? He's suffering. He's pitiable. Okay? Every other time in the books that we've seen where somebody is suffering or somebody is in danger, what does Harry do? He helps them. He stops the danger. He tries to ease the suffering. Mrs. Norris, can't we do something? Nearly hit the snake, just like Flint Fletchley. I feel like I have to do something. Okay? He feels like he has to do something for Hagrid. What motivates that desire to do something. It's that again. Notice love, take revenge off for a minute, love and hate cannot do what? Coexist. Louder? Coexist. Cannot coexist. They cannot occupy 
the same space. What's going to happen? One's going to win out. With Harry, every time, this is the one that wins out. He goes down, ready for bear. He leaves, only feeling compassion for Hagrid. All right? He couldn't brood constantly on revenge if he wanted to help Hagrid. The three of them sat in front of the roaring fire, turning pages of the books, etc., etc., and they're trying to come up with ideas. Okay? So, Christmas comes. Harry gets another sweater. Um, and he gets a new broom. The fireball, the one he lusted after in, you know, the broom shop on Diagon Alley. Who, however, tells McGonagall about the broom? Hermione. Hermione. Why does she tell her? Because she believes that Sirius is the one that sent it and possibly means that there could be a curse on it. So, what does she do to it? They do all kinds of tests to determine if it's dangerous, if there's a jinx on it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What does that do to Hermione's relationship with Harry and I almost said Fred, Harry and Ron? Yeah. Why? Why do you think Rowling does that? I think it's foreshadowing. It's not foreshadowing because we're going to see the exact same thing happen later on. It's foreshadowing because we're going to see something similar in the next book, okay? Not in the sense that somebody's gonna go run telling to McGonagall, but what is this, what do we see here? The, the triumvirate, the three musketeers kind of break. What do we see in book four? It really breaks. Ron just turns his back on Harry, okay? Which is then again, <laughs> foreshadowing for an even greater break in book seven, okay? So, chapter 12, a couple minutes, the Patronus. Harry goes for lessons with Lupin, 237. And Lupin tells him what the Patronus charm does, what the Patronus is. He shows Harry, kind of, okay? It's an anti-dementor, a guardian. It's the word from which we get patron. Like a patron of the arts is a supporter, a guardian of the arts. Or like patron saint, which is a saint that is supposed to guide you, look over you, protect you, defend you. So patron and patronus have a bunch of meanings, all right? Anti-dementor, guardian, shield, protector, defender, deliverer, Savior, they're all embedded in that one word. So, how do you do it? And this is where I think her flaw is. It's silly and trite and Disney. Oh, you have to have a happy thought, like pixie dust, okay? So a happy thought, and you say the words, expecto patronum. Where does it come from? I mean, the Patronus literally comes out of the wand. But the phrase, I think I've put up here before, expect of, ex out of, from, pet, chest, pectoral muscles. O, I. I want what? The Patronum, the next word, from comes from inside. So why can an awful lot of fully qualified witches and wizards not do it? What do they not have? Intestinal fortitude, strength, courage.
courage. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Abolition of Man back in the late 40s. And in it, he argues about a world of men without chests. Okay, It's one of the chapters. It's a uh, book of essays. And what he means by that is men without people, without moral foundations. They don't have a moral code. They have values. Values are different. Okay, What Lewis means there is kind of this bedrock understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Not necessarily black and white, but even, you know, on a spectrum of knowing what is good and what is bad kind of a thing. I think part of what she's doing here is saying only people with this clear understanding and with a strength of character can produce this. Why do I bring up strength of character? Because we're going to be told in the next book. Who of all the students in Moody's Defense Against the Dark Arts class can repel the Imperius curse? Why? Because, I mean, he's already stronger than pretty much a lot of people. Because he has strength of character, Moody will say. It takes strength of character to do that. And we're going to find out in the remainder of that book and then in the next three books, they're an awful lot. The vast majority, it seems to be implied, of witches and wizards can't repel an imperious curse, including a current minister of magic in book seven. But a 14-year-old kid can in book four. Okay? Well, I talk about why on Thursday. We'll finish this. I know we're one day one day behind. Got to get caught up somehow. All right. See you on Thursday.